my first semester here, I taught four classes, uh, four three credit hour classes, two on Tuesday and Thursday, two on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and none of them were the same. So I had four different preparations. Um, and, and that kept me pretty busy that first semester. Fortunately, the next semester there were some repeats, but um, probably uh, I had a, a huge dose of what teaching was about. It wasn't one of those things you go in a classroom and then you know you do a little bit of research and you go home and you don't have to worry about it anymore. And it, it's never been that way for me. It's always been, you know, I, I'm here for the students during the day and I usually end up doing extra work at night. And, I, and that's been from day one. Uh, if I look at the, uh, the types of courses that I had, I had a full range of courses that first semester. One was a, an introduction to engineering technology, which was pretty much first year students. Uh, then I had a couple of other classes that were basic physics, engineering type courses, statics and dynamics, as a, that were sophomores. And then I had a kinematics class uh, that was the junior level class. Uh, the most difficult course I've probably ever taught was that first year class in trying to introduce students to engineering technology and having such a diverse group of students, students that were very interested in the, the technology and, and what was going on and some students that didn't care if they were at the University of Dayton or not. They were here and they weren't very serious and that really set up a, a, a conflict for me as to how I could teach students that wanted to learn and how I could maintain discipline in the classroom with students that had another agenda. And uh, that, that, that was probably the most difficult. But well, I've thought a lot about that and I, I think that back in the 1960s, for instance, every course was its own silo. You would go into that course and you would deal with that material. and. There, there was very little interaction with other students. We didn't do a lot of time studying together. You were pretty much on your own, and, and that was really reflected in industry at the time, too. Uh, very few industries had people that were working on team projects. You were given an assignment, you were sent over in your cubicle, and you worked on the project on your own. Same way in school. Uh, you had a design project, you had uh, a, a, a class of any kind, and you pretty much uh, studied by yourself and there was very little in the way of any team activity. There were no team projects. Now, we're, we're doing, you know, 40 years later, we're doing things completely different. One of, my, one of my missions, I think, as a teacher is to help prepare our students to go into industry. Uh, I've been there, I've uh, done some work with industry since I've been a teacher. I know that a lot of product development, for instance, is uh, oriented toward people working in teams to develop concepts, and now what we're doing is uh, mimicking that or doing that same thing in the classroom. Uh, students work a lot more together. The one class that I'm heavily involved with is deals with the uh, product realization process. We bring in projects from industry and we set student teams send student teams out to the, the companies and have them uh, come in and uh, figure out what the problem is. They interrogate the people at the companies about what the project is about. They uh, identify the need, they come up with the specifications, and then they go through a, 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 a series of steps that involve iterations where you establish the need, you look at the specifications, you get concurrence from the, the company, uh, you develop concepts, you develop intermediate designs, final designs, and now we're at a point where we have what we call a design, build, and test. In one semester and sometimes two semesters, we take the project, identify it, come up with the concepts, uh, design it, uh, build it, and then test it, and in some cases actually turn a turnkey system over to the sponsors. So. Th th that could never have been done by a single individual. So we have teams of three to five people doing that. If everything works perfectly, what happens is this becomes a capstone course and later on you'll be talking to Brother Ray Fitz about the initiative that he started with the Vision 2005 plan back in the early 1990s. And the key, word there were, key words were experiential learning. We want our students to experience what they're going to be confronted with when they're out in the real world. 
we want them to be able to go to companies and hit the deck running because they've had this experience and we've had very positive feedback from companies about that. But the point here is, is that if the, in, in, in theory, if the students have done well in all of these other classes that we used to you know, consider to be silo type classes, they can bring all that technical expertise together and, and put it in to a, a, a team project where, it, as Covey would say in Seven Habits, uh, synergy. Uh, you add everything together, uh, the, 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 the sum is greater than the individual parts. And that's what we're striving for. Do we always do it? Not necessarily. But we are working with the students so that they understand what it takes uh, to be a successful engineer more than just the technology, but be able to work in teams and get along with each other. It would seem like in a silo type class that the, the teacher's job is, is almost the, the sage on the stage to present exactly. the information. It, once you move into kind of team teaching and, and, and experiential learning, how, what's a, what does a good teacher do? How do you define good teaching in, in that kind of context? It takes a lot of experience. Uh, you have to know when to step in and, and uh, help direct the students and you have to know when to get back and let them do their own thing, even if it means failure. Failure meaning that they hit a brick wall, the, the concept that they came up with was perhaps not good and that's why it's an iterative process. They have to back up and continue on. Uh, in, the, in the silo type class, you're right, uh, and I've been there, you know, you, you go up with the board, you provide the theory, you work the examples, and you give them the test, and they look, you know, for their homework problems, they look for the answer in the back of the book. And that's okay to a certain extent. That's what we call analysis. But then on the other side, when you start to deal with what we call design, then there isn't necessarily a correct solution. They can't go back and say, yeah, the answer is 548 foot-pounds. It could be anything. So now it becomes uh, more of a, a situation where there may be many solutions and they have to come up with what they would consider to be an optimum solution. You work with them, you explain to them what the process is, uh, is about, what the expectations are and what the deliverables will be, and they need to come up with a, a, a way to get there. Now, if you see them coming into class and you know they, they seem to be struggling, you sit down and work with them. Uh, but once they're going and they understand what their end result is, you need to pull back from it. So, you know, you, you started with the sage on the sa stage. The opposite is the guide on the side. And when we have a class, it, it's in what we call our design studio. 20 years ago, that used to be a bunch of drawing boards. Now, it's a room full of circular tables where teams can meet face to face. And what they do then is, I will be in that classroom virtually the whole time they are, they're there. And myself and other mentors that are in the class are there to help the students, but we ask them to come to us. We're not going to go over and say, here's your concepts. Now, we think your second concept is the best. We want them to figure that out for themselves. They have to make the decisions. Now, some people have asked us, well, you know, how is this different than co-op? Because when you're out on a co-op assignment, you work in a company, and that co-op employer provides you with a project, and you work on it. The difference is, is that usually when you're working in industry as a co-op, you're working under somebody and they're the guide for you. But you don't necessarily make the decisions, you don't necessarily lead the project. But in this case, a student team, three, four, five, six people together have to figure out the leadership, what the goals are, and they're on their own. And then, uh, hopefully, the, the leadership qualities of some of the people will come out. So that's a... Uh, you know, with the, the difference between the silo and the uh, design classes, we just end up primarily having to just get a pulse for what's going on and making sure that we understand what's happening. Every, every, every teacher has classes that go well or don't go well and courses that go well and don't go well, even semesters that go well and don't go well. How do you know when a class has gone well, what does it mean to you if a class has gone well or a course has gone well, you, you feel like that was a good job, I did a good job in that course, I did a good job in that class. What uh, gives rise to that feeling for you? Well, um, we just had a tough semester. Um, let me tell you what didn't go well. 
one of our objectives was to incorporate other disciplines into these projects. Up until about a year and a half ago, it was pretty much mechanical engineers and engineering technology working on these projects. We wanted to make them multidisciplinary. And as a result, what happened was uh, this year, electrical engineering joined the mechanical engineers in this design class. We had one class in the morning that had 12 students and one class in the afternoon that had 46. And, and that was chaos. Putting 46 into a class where you have 12 projects, the room wasn't big enough, you put four teams in one room and you bring the other eight into another room all at the same time and you have two hours with the students where they can ask you questions. I mean it was like everybody was all over the place. We can't do that anymore. What happens in, in a good class, typically it has to remain or it needs to remain under 20 students in the class. So if we could have up to typically five teams of four on a team. When we do that, then there's enough time where you can sit down with the students, you can just you know, go over and knock on the table, everything going okay, yeah, well what happened about your weekly status report, you said you had a problem, yeah, we've taken care of it, no problem. As long as they stay on schedule, we, we have them at the very beginning of the class come up with what is known as a Gantt chart. It's a complete schedule of every phase of the product realization process and where they plan to be at the end of the year. If the class is manageable and you have good students that focus on the end result, that goes well. But you can't do it with a large class. So one of the things that we talked about in the early 1990s was if, if you're the uh, sage on the stage, you have to be there all the time. But if you're the guide on the side, it's not going to require as much time. I found out that that's not the case. Uh, if you're the guide on the side, you're out working with the students, you're there for them, and a lot of times you have to help them figure out how they're going to purchase equipment, how they're going to deal with uh, the purchasing department, accounts payable, all of that stuff. So uh, you can pretty much tell a, a several weeks into the term if things are going to go well or not.